farmers, and you'll, you'll get a sense of the sorts of farmers that we're working with in this program. Then I had a PowerPoint, but last night I decided I didn't really like the PowerPoint, so I decided I was going to talk to you instead. Good. So I've made myself some notes. Um, so if we could start with the PowerPoint, Melanie, I mean with the uh, with the video, please. Four years into its five-year pilot phase, Purchase for Progress, or P4P, is generating a wealth of information. The World Food Program and its partners are learning how the program is changing the lives of smallholder farmers. These lessons are being discussed with all stakeholders to shape future programs and policies. One of the most promising lessons people have shown us is that smallholder farmers are quick to learn about and improve quality when the security of a contract to sell to WFP goes with the training they receive. The food offered to WFP in the beginning often did not meet quality standards, but the farmers adapted swiftly. P4P has stimulated markets in, in, in Kenya. When we began, uh, the farmers didn't know where to sell their grain, didn't know about quality aspects. They only produced, and they were asking traders, how much would you pay for this product of mine? They didn't care about quality. But when we intervened, we have trained them on quality aspects. And they have realized that quality actually adds value, and therefore it has a competitive market, and they're facing higher prices. A related lesson involves the capacity of farmers' organizations to aggregate and market grains collectively. Even with the possibility of a contract selling to WFP, this is not easily achieved. To build that capacity, the crucial elements are improving mutual trust within the organizations and enabling access to credit. <laughs> P4P's main target is to build the capacity of smallholders to access markets on a sustainable basis. WFP is working with stakeholders in the pilot countries to build opportunities for smallholders to link to other quality-oriented buyers beyond WFP, such as local traders processes. P4P is teaching us how to negotiate with potential new buyers. It's a school for the producer to help them in the future. This year, two or three companies came and were interested in buying grain from us. This means that our dealings with WFP has reached the ears of these companies. P4P's ability to connect farmers to markets so far has been made possible by a wide range of partnerships with national governments, UN agencies, NGOs, the private sector, and many others. What's exciting is to see the breadth of the donor interest and the partnership interest in P4P. And it's across the whole spectrum. It's technical partners, it's donor partners, it's uh, government partners. It's very exciting. And uh, I think we probably had, had hope for this. It's just really nice to see that it's actually happening. One particular challenge, especially in the early stages, was to find partners who were working with farmers in the field to help them increase their production. This meant that less surplus was available to buy than imagined at the start of P4P, and that farmers are increasingly recognizing the value of investing in quality inputs and good farming practices. <coughs> Many challenges remain, in particular, promoting the social and economic empowerment of women in agriculture. Most women involved in agriculture in the pilot countries are not autonomous. They depend on men, and in most cases, men are the nominal owners of their household assets. But P4P is showing early signs of success. <laughs> Another challenge that is being tackled is facilitating access to finance for smallholders. Farmers' organizations need credit 
to buy inputs, such as seeds and fertilizer, and to finance collective marketing after the harvest. They also need credit so they can pay their members in cash as fast as possible. Working with financial institutions and experts on rural finance, E4P is testing different approaches to facilitate access to financial services. But despite these and other hurdles, E4P has shown that by combining demand and supply side support, smallholder farmers can grow more, sell more, and earn more. By the end of 2013, practices and lessons identified will be applied beyond P4P. They will be integrated into WFP's program of work and models will be identified that can help national government to promote smallholder development. We need to build more people peace kind of program, more open kind of program that will encourage farmers. We will give farmers a reason to want to go out there besides being for food. And that's the market. And that's what P4P has done, has demonstrated in the world. WFP and partners will continue to document and share lessons learned from the P4P experience and will conduct a final evaluation of the program in 2014. <laughs> okay, so let me start by saying that the World Food Program today is not the World Food Program 20 years ago. Uh, we now procure for cash about 60% of the food that we use in our programs. And of that, we buy about 80% in developing countries. So we've become a major buyer of staple commodities. Uh, we're buying now about 1.2 billion US dollars a year for cash. Uh, but we buy it through competitive tenders from very large traders. So the way the value chain works in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, for those few of you who may not be uh, familiar, is that the small farmer cultivates his, his plot of five hectares, three hectares, two hectares, but it's very low input, very poor basic practices, and very low yields. So the farmer is, uh, is reaping often about one ton per hectare, whereas for maize, for example, you can, you can go up to seven. Um, and he sells at the farm gate with a small amount of surplus, usually in 100 kg sacks, but the farmer's not making a profit. From this. At the best, they're breaking even. So you really don't have an incentive to increase production. Uh, and we know the technologies exist, but farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa haven't adopted uh, those technologies to increase production. And the reason is actually fairly basic. If, uh, if there's no market, no competitive market, why should you borrow, invest, increase your production, and then sell it at a cost of production or even less. So the seed for Purchase for Progress, or P4P, began in the early 2000s when in a number of countries, different uh, country teams, country directors and staff, began to experiment on how we could link the smallholder farmers and farmers cooperatives to that WFP demand. So if I take Uganda as an example, when Marguerite, my wife and I, arrived in Uganda in uh, 2001, uh, we were not buying much in Uganda as WP. We were buying. We bought 22,000 tons in Uganda in 2002. Uh, and then we made an effort to ramp up local production because Uganda is a very uh, fertile country full of smallholder farmers. And by putting out the market signals and letting the trade know that we were interested in buying significantly greater quantities of maize and beans in Uganda. By 2006, we were buying 200,000 tons a year, so almost 10 times as much for us as WFP to use in Uganda and to export regionally to the Eastern DRC and, and Rwanda and South Sudan. And we were injecting about $50 million into the Ugandan economy, buying this food in country. But the profits were flowing to a few, four or five large trades who installed the cleaning and drying equipment uh, and bagging equipment to be able to sell to WFP. One of them actually rented the land right next to our warehouse outside of Kampala and installed the equipment there. So the commodity was being grown by the small farmers, but they weren't 
the ones who were capturing the margin by selling to W3, a high quality product. So the basic concept is to work with farmers to improve quality and to earn more by selling that higher quality product to a quality buyer who will pay top dollar, which is us, and let the farmers capture more of that margin. And with staple crops, you have to remember that the margin is fairly small for staples, for cereals, beans, peas. Uh, it tends to be between 20 and 50 percent from the farm gate to the final buyer, uh, depending on which country. In Ethiopia, it's only about 20, and Kenya, it's about 50. So when P4P was born in late 2008, conceived and discussed throughout the course of 2008, there were quite a number of people present at the birth. Uh, one of them was Howard G. Buffett, who was, of course, a major donor to the continent here. Uh, another was Bill Gates. Another was Raj Shah, who, of course, is now the administrator of uh, USA, but at the time ha was the director of health programs at, at BMGF, the Melinda Gates Foundation, or, which began with their investments in, in health, global health, and when they decided that they needed, if they would affect the quality of life of poor people in Sub-Saharan Africa, to also become involved in agriculture, they moved Raj Shah as a capable, out-of-the-box thinker to be the head, first head of their agriculture program. So Raj was there. And our newly appointed executive director of WP, named Jose Sheeran, who, when she left WP in 2012, went to the World Economic Forum and left that and is now the head of the Asia Society, basically. So uh, the Bill and Gates Foundation's intent was to invest along value chains for staple crops uh, and to through that, achieve systemic change at a national level for millions of small farms. And they invest specifically, they were investing specifically in Sub Saharan Africa. They've now added Bangladesh and Arisa and Bihar, India to that list. Um, they were thinking that if you invest in research and extension, policy, financial services for the poor, as they call it, they're going to achieve quite rapidly a major boost in productivity, which was perhaps a little naive that you put in money and the productivity follows quickly. And they thought they needed to have an off taker uh, who had the capacity to absorb that surplus production from small owners. So when P4P began, it was really conceived as being the off taker, that there was going to be this huge boost in productivity and that somebody had to be there willing to buy it. So it made sense because we are a very significant buyer of staple quality crops in Sub-Saharan Africa. However, most of what's sold in Sub-Saharan Africa is still sold informally. A lot of it crosses borders, but it crosses borders on the back of bicycles. It, it isn't really recorded in the statistics. But when you talk about formal trade, then WFP becomes a major player. Um, we do have the demand with that $1.2 billion a year, and we can buy that surplus. And of course, we use that food in WFP programs. We use it to feed refugees. We use it for food for assets programs, as we call them, which the older name is Food for Work. We use it in school meals programs. Uh, we use it in maternal child health programs. Now, another one of the objectives of the grant that we were given by the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation was to transform WFP's own food purchase model of buying from these very large traders. And we buy from some big international companies, too. We buy from Cargill. We buy from Ola. Uh, and I will say that thanks to the five years of experimentation we've had from B4P, this change in mindset really has happened. And there was a lot of skepticism in WFP at the beginning as to whether it was worth our while to engage with small owners. That you know it works, it works now. We're interested in significant quantities. Uh, we want the best price. We want the delivery on time. We have a system set up. We have a a, uh, a performance bond of five percent bank. 
uh, so that if, if the trader doesn't deliver on time, we cash the performance bond. Uh, you know, everything was working smooth. So our procurement folks were saying, why should we make this extra effort to work with small? It's more trouble than it's worth. And, you know, we're going to have quality problems, we're going to have delivery problems, you know, the quantities are going to be smaller, it's going to be accurate. But I will say now, five years later, our procurement division is convinced, and corporately the organization is convinced, that smallholder supported procurement is really the way forward for them. And uh, later I'll tell you a little bit about some of our plans to scale up. But uh, the idea of P4P is incredibly attractive to governments, um, as well as donors. So we were going to have a 10-country pilot with Bill and Linda Gates Foundation. Howard came forward at the same time and said, oh, but I like this idea. I want to invest in this in, in Central America. So before we even signed the grant with Gates Foundation, Howard funded us to do this in four countries in Central America and also said, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does not invest in post-conflict countries. I'm very interested in post-conflict, as his investments in the Combat Center uh, underline. And I will give you funding to try this in some post-conflict settings and see what happens. I'll give you some seed money, and then if it works, you can go find more money to give. So he gave us funding uh, to try this in Sierra Leone and Liberia and South Sudan. Uh, Belgium came forward right off the bat and said, we're really interested in trying to, to boost smallholder productivity and uh, connections to the markets in the DRC. We will give you money if you'll do this together with FAO. We've had a proposal. Boom. Next thing we knew, DRC was added to the list. Canada came forward and said, oh, no, we're very interested in funding this. Uh, where, could we, where could we support it? And they ended up supporting it in Ghana and Afghanistan. So we started off when this was launched in September 2008 officially uh, on the sidelines of the General Assembly in New York uh, with 20 pilot countries instead of 10 which is, makes it a huge pilot, sort of pilot in 20 countries. They're very different countries. I mean, five of them are post-conflict countries, DRC, South Sudan, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Afghanistan. Some of them are lower middle income countries, like the four in Latin America, and 15 of them are in Africa. Uh, the money that was put in uh, leveraged more, and uh, we have ended up now with 16 different donors. The P for P. Um, and I will say that the, the, the enthusiasm and the support for it has continued from governments in the countries that we're in, and we are constantly besieged by requests to do this elsewhere. In fact, when our executive director went to Somalia recently and met the president, uh, what, what do they say? They, yes, we're very thankful, we're very happy that you're providing all of this emergency assistance. But what we really would like you to open here, we want you to do a P4P program. I mean, this has been happening to us over and over. The technical partners, like you saw of the, the man in Kenya there, uh, and mostly the smallholder farms. So it's very sobering for those of us who have been involved in this because the expectations have been so incredibly high from the very beginning. And it was always conceived as an experiment that we would try different things, we would think out of the box, uh, and we wouldn't be afraid to fail. That it was fine if you made an effort, as long as you could understand why something worked or didn't. Uh, so what's different from P4P than what's been tried in the past with ag development projects in Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, well, I mean, African governments for at least 40 years have been saying that they were going to reduce poverty, by commercializing the smallholder farming sector. And every time you look at a World Bank PRSP paper, that's what you're going to read. Uh, and they do that, of course, because most of the rural, uh, most of the poor are rural smallholder farmers, although it's becoming increasingly urban, I should add. So, I mean, if, if this was an easy challenge to take on, smallholder farmers would be increasing production and making profits all across sub-Saharan Africa. That hadn't happened. 
And there have, of course, been many development efforts to try to achieve this goal. But the smallholder farmers still haven't adopted these technologies. So what's different is that P4P is the first program to date to link a reliable source of demand, the market, to the capacity building for the smallholder farm, and certainly at scale. Uh, so it was designed, as I keep underlining, as an experiment to use that demand as a catalyst to bring different players across the value chain together around a common effort, knowing that there was an assured market for quality if the smallholders could bring it to market. And why WFP? Why not FAO? Why not uh, CLUSA to lead this effort? And uh, again, the answer is because there is no other entity that could bring that assured, steady, patient demand for quality staking crops to the table. So you know, we see ourselves as a patient buyer linked to the chain. Uh, but I absolutely want to underline that we are one piece of a puzzle. It's a very big and complex puzzle. We're bringing the demand, but we're one piece, just one piece of the puzzle. And we focus on staple crops. We don't focus on the cash crops because that's what WP buys and uses in its program. We buy cereals for the carbohydrates in our rations. We buy pulses for the proteins in our rations. We buy vegetable oils for the fats. And we produce with the private sector and buy blended foods, which are fortified and often have vitamin mixes in them for special nutritional needs. Um, and staple crops are what the poor grow. And that's why the Bill of the Gates Foundation and Howard were so interested in this. Uh, and they grow them both for subsistence and they also grow them in the market as cash. So it's a little false what we talk sometimes about all those subsistence farmers in Africa. Because the reality is most people are semi-subsistence and they have got a, a diversified livelihood strategy. And some of that involves growing those subsistence crops and also selling them, some of them, because you need some cash to pay back loans, to pay for medical care, to pay for school. Uh, so we thought, and when I left Mozambique uh, in 2009 and was asked to come to Rome to, uh, to take on the P4P, I thought that we would be able to contact Unilever and uh, others and we were going to find that there was a great deal of experience working with smallholder farmers and we could take their lessons and we could incorporate them. But what we found out very fast is A, they've only worked with high value cash crops, very specialized, and they re do not reach large numbers of smallholder farmers. For example, Unilever, which has said that they will sustainably reach 500,000 smallholder farmers by, I think, next year, um, only has a direct relationship with smallholder farmers with T and Kenya. Basta finished. They had an idea to get involved with horticulture in Kazakhstan and Tanzania. It fell apart. They buy from traders. They do contract farming. The traders do contract farming. They have no relationship as soon as left with smallholders except for that tea in Kenya. It is only to the trader. And the trader is responsible for the thing. Walmart is the same thing. Walmart has said we are going to source sustainably from so many smallholder farmers. But again, they don't deal with staples. And yes, they're buying from some vegetable producing farmers, but they don't have these big links to smallholders themselves. Uh, so it's a very unique experiment, and it was designed as, a, as an experiment. And we went around about by developing a specific country implementation plan based on an assessment in each one of the 20 countries that was designed to, A, link to others working in agricultural market development, and B, to address the specific bottlenecks of the value chain in that specific country. Um, and to learn the lessons about how to do this right, and then try to take it to scale in the second phase, and which is what we're coming into right now. So, you know, if I have to describe P4P in one word, it's catalyst. Uh, it has become a catalyst across those 20 countries to bring the actors together. And it really has catalyzed quite amazing things uh, country by country. And I invite all of you 
if you happen to be in one of these 20 countries, and they're listed on these handouts here, and they're very easy to find because we have a good website, uh, I invite you to come and visit P4P when you're in the country. You really cannot grasp the impact on smallholder farmers' lives from a report or from a little video or from listening to me. And every time I go out, I am just bowled over by the number of smallholder farmers who said, for me and my family, this has been life changing. I have never made a profit before. I'm making a profit now. And I've taken that money. And I have invested in my children's education. I am now even sending the kids off to college. I have improved my house from a mud house with a, with a dirt floor to a proper house with a tin roof. Still very simple houses, but really from semi-subsistence to small entrepreneur, country by country. And they're taking the profit and just as we hoped, reinvesting. They are buying goats and breeding the goats. They are setting up small shops. They are uh, finding ways to multiply the money. In, in DRC, they started to set up community pharmacies because they had no pharmacies. In so, and then try to impact on the health and they brought people together to, to buy goats jointly and breed the goats. So uh, the testimonies uh, are really quite astounding. But there are still huge challenges to this to be absolutely certain and must be recognized, and I'm going to come to those in a moment. So we have moved as WFP from a situation where we were buying negligible quantities from smallholders, cooperatives, or, or mechanisms that we could try to link them to, uh, in 2008, to now buying 4% from pro-smallholder methodologies, uh, modalities, and we, which is about 30 to $40 million a year that we're buying now from smallholders. And we want to ramp that up to 10% in the next few years, so that we're buying somewhere in the order of 100 to 120 million annually in a pro small world. Uh, and I have got to stress that systemic change at a national scale does not happen in four or five years. I mean, it probably takes at least 10. So our goal is systemic change at a national level. And probably the best example is Rwanda which is an unusual country, as many of you know, because although the RPF and Paul Kagame, certainly there are some questions about uh, uh, civil liberties and uh, democracy within the country, there is a huge uh, commitment to trying to make development work. And after one year of P for P training the cooperatives and starting to buy from the cooperatives that we targeted, we worked with ACDI BOCA, funded through Feed the Future in Rwanda, and the Government Extension Service. The government said, this is what we want. This is exactly what we want to be doing. So we want to put extension workers in to work with you. We want to take this national in Rwanda. Uh, and we want to set up a program. Let's call it Common P4P. And then we, the government, will run this thing. So we set up a Common P4P in year two in Rwanda. Um, and the government mandated we will now buy 40% of what we buy for our strategic grain reserve from farmers cooperatives and now they've taken it one step further they're buying 40% of everything for the army hospital school feeding blah, blah. they've also found that there's plenty of constraints you can't just mandate this and boom everything happens so they haven't reached the 40% there's been hiccups uh, we've done a very good study on it that is part of the, the learning, and I'll come to the learning piece in a bit. Um, so, I mean, Rwanda is the sort of thing that we were hoping would happen, and that's starting to happen in numerous of these first pilot countries, uh, faster than we had thought it would. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, quantitative achievements, which, and I don't think you can measure P for P just by dollars and tons, but we have successfully contracted $160 million from uh, directly from farmers' organizations or through warehouse receipt systems, which we've been trying to grow by putting demand through WRS. 
or through commodity exchanges, which are fairly problematic in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, or through processors that have been linked to farmers. Uh, we've tried new procurement modalities ourselves. We've never done forward contracts before for food, which we are now doing. Um, we had never bought from warehouse receipt systems before. We had never bought from commodity exchanges before. We're finding those are very good, but they're not very widespread effectively, but they work for us. Uh, and of that 160 million we've contracted, we have about 110 million plus delivered so far in our warehouses uh, and paid for. The balance is under delivery and uh, or it's been defaulted. And our defaults are running at about 20%, uh, which is largely side set. And of course, we've been doing this in a very unusual period because 2008, when this was conceived, was the year of the high food prices. And uh, markets everywhere have been extremely volatile ever since. So what has happened is we've signed contracts, and then a trader has come along and said, I'll match that WFP contract, and I'll give you the cash right now. And that's not bad. They have to learn how to honor contracts. They must learn. But sometimes they've been able to actually get more money quickly because one of the challenges for us is our systems. We are a UN agency. We must be accountable. We have got, we don't have the liberty of running around with the cash in our pocket. And we can't go to an individual farm. We have to go to an organization or a warehouse where it's been aggregated. So uh, we can't compete, or should we, in the same way that a small trader or medium. So we're also tried working with small traders and medium scale traders uh, who are thankfully reacting now to the fact that uh, improved quality does bring a higher price. But it can be a challenge. Um, So on the flip side of that 20% defaults, we do have 80% success, which is pretty good, actually, that meet the stringent quality standards that we use. And because we are feeding people, largely women and children, we must stick to them. So a lot of the training has been food safety and food quality and training smallholders how to test for aflatoxin and mycotoxins how to clean to get to the standard. We've been providing a lot of moisture meters. We've been working with farmers on a cost share basis to improve storage facilities, training farmers on storage. Um, and it's also important to note that we're tracking the sales to buyers other than the World Food Program. So, so far we've got, we've, we've got about $50 million of sales by the groups that we've been training to other buyers. Uh, which is really quite a significant achievement considering that very few farmers organizations were marketing collectively before P4P. They were largely doing inputs, but not marketing. Um, and we have gathered a huge amount of knowledge and documentation uh, from this experiment because one of the pillars of this has been learning and sharing. Uh, we have this evaluation, as you heard in the film, going on right now. It's called a strategic final evaluation. It's being undertaken by uh, a very qualified consulting firm in the UK called Oxford Policy Management, OPM, which is, grew out of Oxford University and then spun off from the university and became an independent consulting entity. Uh, it's a pretty grueling evaluation because it started the first week of January and it's going to go on through November. A very expensive one that our evaluation department has put a lot of their annual budget into. Uh, we will see the extent to which production has increased. Uh, we will see the extent to which income has increased because we set this up at the very beginning to have a formal rigorous impact assessment. And we set up a what we call the technical review panel of nine experts in monitoring and evaluation and agriculture and market development to advise us on how to do this problem. 
So on that panel, which has met consistently throughout P2P as our advisors, we have IFRI, the World Bank, the African Union, FAO, EFAD, um, Catholic Relief Services, ECA, which is the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, uh, Oxfam, and who am I forgetting today? Texas A&M. Not yet. Yeah, Not yet. <laughs> um, Michigan State University. Sorry. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Dave Shirley. Yeah, you. you were in the right. You were right. It was an American institution okay. of higher learning. Uh, a land grant. Uh, so we started off saying, all right, we'll do a baseline in all 20 countries. We actually managed to get a baseline that, and we in WP aren't very good at impact assessment because we live hand to mouth, hand to mouth. And if you're a WP country director, you spend much too much of your time fundraising and trying to keep your programs going and your staff there. We don't have five year programs that are funded where you could do an impact assessment. I bet you. Okay. So, you know, P4P has been completely unique. It's the first time I think we've ever done formal impact assessments uh, with a baseline. And, of course, to do this right, you have to have control groups that hold, that have got all the characteristics that are similar to the treatment groups. So those, those uh, control groups have held in four of the countries, and this technical review panel said was from day one, right after I arrived in Rome, you can't do an impact assessment in 20 countries. It's too much work. It's too much analysis. It's overkill. But our M&E advisor said, I really, I'm nervous about how many of these are going to hold. Let's try, and then by the end of it, we'll see how many we still have that we can follow through. And it's good we did, because we've ended up with four of the control groups held throughout five years. For example, in Rwanda, when the government said, let's do this with all the cooperatives, there are, we had a great baseline. Our control groups went right out the window. Um, some countries didn't do very good baselines. Boom, everything out the window. Mm -hmm. So we've ended up with Ethiopia, Tanzania, Ghana, and El Salvador as the four. Um, now, because the treatment period ended in December 2013, we are in the process of doing the final year surveys at a household level with panel surveys of the households. We, we do household level surveys, trader surveys, farm organization surveys, and market surveys. Some annually, some biannually. Uh, so those are underway right now. We have committed to the evaluators that we will put three of them into their hands, analyzed and completed in June, with Tanzania earlier, a little earlier than that. Because Ghana didn't start till 2010, so the last year of the treatment period, 2011, will be 2015, so that, that one won't be part of the evaluation. The other point I wanted to make is that P4P is absolutely built on partnerships. We couldn't do this as WP alone. Uh, it would have been foolish to ever try that. It's not a standalone effort. It's part of this larger puzzle that I mentioned. So we've got over 200 ongoing partnerships, which are with government ministries and extension services, they're with research institutions, um, they are with private sector entities, including financial institutions, because we've been trying to find credit providers for these farmers' organizations. They are with UN agencies, we've been trying to work consistently with FAO, and where we can with EFED as well. Uh, they are very significantly with a lot of local and international NGOs, and they're with regional organizations such as ECA, which has done, for example, the, the production training uh, and organizational management training with us in Central America, in three of the four countries in Central America. Uh, it also includes many other organizations that are funded by Buffett or by the Gates Foundation. You may know Harvest Plus. We're very much in bed with them trying to multiply these biofortified uh, High iron beans, high protein maize, uh, and some orange flesh sweet potatoes uh, with Agra. We've been working very closely with, with Agra, with uh, CGIAR institutions, and as I said, very significantly with NGOs. So, the number of farmers or members of the organizations that we engaged with is something over 1.1 million. 
Five, over 500,000 of those farmers have directly received training through the program. Uh, and the areas of training are very interesting. Because I said, you know, we were trying to figure this out as we went along. The sort of operational research, instead of getting everything right before it began, we were always running by the seat of our pants in some ways. But the training has been in production and productivity. It's been in agribusiness management. It's been in agro-processing. It's been in credit and what we call financial literacy. Uh, it's uh, been in post-harvest handling. And very interestingly, it's been in gender equity. And about half our country coordinators for people here are women, who not surprisingly have been very committed to the concept of gender equity. But, uh, and I'm going to come back to gender in a minute. Uh, in particular, I do want to stress that we really have tried to make this a joint RBAF, Rome based agency effort. Uh, with FAO, although it was pretty ad hoc, we have collaborated in one way or another in 16 of the 20 countries on the ground. Um, in some, we received joint funding for implementation at the very beginning, like in DRC, and in Mozambique, uh, and in, in Guatemala. We are working with the investment center at FAO to do a sort of modified cost-benefit analysis of PPP. But because we didn't set this up to gather all the economic data for a formal CBA at the beginning, we're calling it investment analysis. Um, that will go into the evaluation. It will also be finished ideally in March or probably April. We're working with the uh, Agro Industry and Rural Infrastructure Division at FAO on seven case studies of seven different countries because they are studying institutional buying around the world. Um, we've been working with the Gender Equity and Rural Employment Division. We've been working with the Trade Markets Division at FAO, and it is someone from that division, Shukri Ahmed, if any of you know it, who's been the member of the Technical Review Panel from FAO. Um, and with EFAD, we've worked with EFAD funded projects in El Salvador, in Honduras, and in Mozambique, and looking towards that in Ethiopia and possibly Ghana. But of course, EFAD doesn't fund. Uh, a project and run it themselves. They provide loans to governments, and the governments set up a project management unit, and that runs the project. So what we've actually been doing is collaborating with the government project funded under the EFAT loan. Uh, now, gender. Uh, I've got a sheet on gender there, and I do urge you when you, when we're done, to please take the gender sheet, take a look at it later. That was really new territory. Uh, when we signed the grant agreement with the Gates Foundation, which funds 50% of people, and I should say Canada and Howard each fund about 20%. And USAID has put a lot of money into it, but a lot of that's been for buying the food. But some of it has very much been technical as well. Uh, we said that, yes, we agree to put gender at the center of this, and the way that Gates suggested this be done is to say 50% of the members of the farmers you work with should be women, and 30% of the leadership of those organizations should be women. But we realized very fast that that wasn't going to get us where we needed to be. It, it's not really a numbers game. It's not about how many women are on the books, but still sit in the back, never say a thing, and really have no control over what goes on in the organization. Uh, so we developed a gender strategy working with uh, IDS, Institute for Development Studies in the UK. They, they had set up a project called Agricultural Learning Impact Network, which was focused on gender. And we worked with a line uh, to develop a strategy that was relevant for P2P, and we identified four groups of women we really should target. One was those who were growing and marketing crops that we could buy. But of course, most women, we had realized quickly, may work on the family farm. And that's why people say 70% of the farmers in Africa are women. But they really are providing unpaid family labor to a farm that's in usually the husband's name. In very few countries now, is it jointly. Um, and it's the husband who controls the production decisions and the sales and the income. 
So working, yes, with women's groups in some of these countries, we were able to link directly to women who were making production decisions, but that was not a huge number. Um, the second group is unpaid family labor. How could we reach these women who work in agriculture but are not officially the farmer? Uh, how could we work with women who are traders? Because, of course, women do a lot of trade. Uh, and how could we work with women who are casual laborers? Uh, so we have come up with gender action plans in about 15 of the 20 countries. It's involved a lot of business training. It's involved bringing in female extension agents who then target women specifically. It has involved uh, labor-saving technologies for women. And that's a place USA has invested quite significantly. Uh, and it's involved, interestingly, gender equity training in many of these countries for men and women, not just for women. And I have been intrigued how open many men, who we never would have thought were, sensitive when they started to think about the way things were, how they might be different. I mean, for example, when I was in Mali, not very many months ago, which is such a traditional society. They took me to one village um, where when the women had organized themselves into a women's group that started marketing pigeon feeds to us, and they started to earn money, hard cash. And you know, WFP contracts are big. So if a group comes into a village with $50,000 or $100,000, I mean, that's huge money. So the chief and the men realized, my goodness, these women are really onto something good here. They gave them 50 hectares to farm. They allocated them. And a lot of, in Mali, the husband allocates land to each of his wives that she can use. And that's where she grows what she wants to grow. They started to say, well, this is good. This is great for the family. This is great for the village. OK, wife, you can have four times as much land next to you. And this is the sort of thing that started to happen with some of this gender training, which I wouldn't have really foreseen. But it's not a panacea. I mean, it's progress, but it's not a panacea. We've done a paper on it, which we just, I just asked to make sure they put it online, so you should be able to get that from our website, or I can send it to you. Um, i give you a couple of other country examples. I mentioned one. Uh, in Ethiopia, we've been working very closely with uh, what's called the Agricultural Transformation Agency, because Mela Sanawi decided that if he was going to really develop agriculture in Ethiopia, he needed to cut through the red tape that has sort of cut things back. And of course, we're talking about a country that is approaching 80 million people, most of whom are semi-subsistence farmers. And interestingly, not farming anywhere close to the five hectares that we had decided to interpret smallholder farmers. They tend to be farming one or less than one, but they're well organized in the primary cooperatives and, and uh, forums and unions. So they set up the Agricultural Transformation Agency to bring together all the needed actors to transform agriculture in Ethiopia, bring together government. So they, we formed together what's called the Maize Alliance, because in Ethiopia we've been buying maize. Uh, and it brings together the government, the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, the Extension Service, us uh, and technical partners. So there we've got TechnoServe as our technical partner working on training on business plans for both the cooperative unions that we're buying from. We have 29 of them that we're buying from in Ethiopia. And they average around 20,000 members apiece. So they are huge unions. And um, of course, that is made up then of, I shouldn't say, the big ones are 20,000. On average, they're about 10,000. But they're made up then of multiple primary cooperatives to feed into the union. So, uh, and Sasakawa Africa Association has been one of our big technical providers, as well as the extension service. So, we have organized credit for these cooperative unions, which were not marketed before. They were doing influence, but they weren't marketing. Um, at least they weren't marketing any staples. So with the Cooperative Bank of 
Ethiopia, as we've done in other countries, it was agreed that the contract could be used as collateral, so that the union did not have to put up collateral for the loan. And Ethiopia is a nice case where, uh, because government is so involved, uh, interest rates are 7% for the cooperative unions, very reasonable. Uh, so we've signed $15 million worth of contracts this year with those cooperative unions. Uh, and the challenges we've still got there are post-harvest loss reduction, uh, gender equity, the country that we've got the smallest percentage of women in these organizations is Ethiopia. It's 13%. If we take Ethiopia out of the mix, we're close to 50% now. But Ethiopia brings the whole number down to around 30 because it's our biggest country. Um, and we're working now to bring the private sector on board in Ethiopia as an off-taker with us. Okay, Tanzania. We've been working with what's called Savings and Credit Cooperative Societies, SACOs, uh, which are about 47% women. But what we discovered in Tanzania was the cooperative movement had completely fallen apart at the time of structural adjustment. And therefore, there was no collective marketing of staples going on before P for P. There was just individual sales by farmers to small traders. Um, we worked very assiduously with them on improving the storage conditions. There were a lot of old warehouses, but they really needed to be upgraded, so it's tenants co-funded by the community and by us. Um, and we worked very closely with the cooperative agency, which is trying to gain traction again. Uh, and the extension service, as well as with Agra, found local NGOs that we could work with as the trainers there. Uh, and now we have worked on transforming those SACOs, which are supposed to be doing savings and credit, they're not supposed to be doing market, to two different types of marketing entities that we can compare. Uh, one is what it was always on the books but didn't exist, which is called an agricultural marketing cooperative, an AMCO. And the other are private marketing entities, actually creating private registered trading companies that are made up of the farmers. We've signed an MOU with the National Food Reserve Agency, NFRA in Tanzania, that if they will offtake from the farmers' organizations, we will buy them. And the MOU says that we will buy up to 200,000 tons a year from them, but that we want that procurement to be coming to a substantial percentage from farmers' organizations. So it's begun. And last year was the first year that they started to buy from the cooperatives that we're buying from NFR. Um, it is the first country that the investment division of FAO went into to look at the benefits, trying to add in, um, in this return on investment study, uh, some of the social returns and try to quantify them. So one of their conclusions was that with this training that farmers have switched from selling by volume to weight, that that alone has added about 20% to the farmer's return. Because they were selling such a low quality that traders, and this has happened in many countries, because they're doing it by volume, they know darn well that they're buying 1.2 times the weight that they're paying for, but their excuse has been, to themselves anyway, well, I'm buying such a low quality that this way I recoup some of what otherwise would be a loss. But when the farmers start learning about quality and they start learning about wait, they start watching the scale, and they start waking themselves. Um, they found that training has had a significant spillover effect to non-members of the farmers' organizations, uh, that the impact goes well beyond the targeted crops, and that the fact that we've now got a commercial mindset with these farmers is flowing over to horticulture, and it's flowing over to the cash flow, which is what we had hoped. That agriculture is now perceived by these farmers as a business, and not just a semi-subsistence undertaking, that they've learned how to record expenditures, uh, that they uh, are now calculating business plans. And remember, in the, these people tend to be with primary school education. Not, not everybody in these organizations by any means has a primary degree. And often the leadership are those who've got some high school. And in a rare case, you find someone who's graduated from high school. Uh, and the women, of course, tend to have even less education. In many countries, like Guatemala, all the women, okay, 95% of the women, 
their education level is zero. Not one year of primary school. So I should add that literacy training as part of this gender equity is also now factored in. Um, and a very positive impact on reducing post-harvest losses. So their conservative uh, model, which I think may even be, they say it's conservative, but I think it may be too big. But the Fow Investment Center claims that their model shows an annual increase in income of $3 million for the farmers from the investment that we put in. Um, but I have to caution, that's a model <laughs> that they've come up with. It's not based on the hard data, as that's not what our equity system uh, could provide for a classic uh, cost benefit analysis. Um, we've still got plenty of challenges in Tanzania. Uh, one is our own resource constraints for us buying, which is why we want to buy from the NFRA, because then we can ideally export it. But then another challenge is government interference in the market in Tanzania because they keep slapping on export bans. And uh, another one is poor rural infrastructure because the roads in Tanzania are really bad. And to get the food out when the rainy season, you're dealing with almost impassable situations. I'm going to skip to Uganda, uh, skip Burkina, I think. Mali has really been a very notable success for us. Um, I would have never thought. There we said, we're going to focus on the more traditional crops. We're going to focus on millet. We're going to focus on sorghum. We're going to focus on beans. We're going to focus on pigeon peas. The government really took on strong engagement from the beginning. Uh, we have very strong partnerships with partners. Catholic Relief Services and Africa there in particular. Um, and we have some very strong local district farmer organizations that joined the program. Uh, that were built by investments of the Quebecois cooperative movement over the last 10 years. And that's another conclusion we really come to, is that it takes about 10 years of technical capacity building to come up with a really strong, sustainable farmers organization as a cooperative. Five years is really not enough. And of course, we've got groups, some that we formed at the beginning of this, some that have been around for a while, we've classified them all into high capacity, medium capacity, low capacity, and then we have them at all scales. We've got some that are first level, smaller rural producer organizations, then we've got forums, which are often like cooperatives that are made up of groups of villages, and then we have some that are groups of forums and involve whole regions or national. Um, so in Mali, we've actually exceeded the procurement plan we had by three times. We've been able to even export to Niger and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and the government, this new government that's in place after the last election, is very keen to work with us to do what they've done in Rwanda, as, and, as is Burkina. Um, and that's the government that was elected in July last year. So they should be around for a while, hopefully. Um, and challenges there, well, the crisis, of course, is a big one. Um, and it made it difficult for them to maintain the input supply during that crisis. Uh, aflatoxin, again, train, 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 test, test, test. Uh, and the climate impacts, because drought and locusts are inevitably cyclical problems. So what are the big challenges that we see everywhere? Inadequate supply of the proof seed. There's a lot of great varieties around that have come out of the research stations. It hasn't been multiplied to the extent it needs to be. It's not available for the smallholder farmer out in the rural areas. Uh, an inadequate agro dealer network in the rural areas to get those out and to get fertilizer out. Very limited financial services with affordable rates of credit for farmers organizations. When we started out, that was a huge constraint the first couple of years. Some countries now we have got private banks trusting the, the contracts as collateral and offering good rates, decent affordable rates of credit that are much better than MFIs, which tend to be very risk averse to agriculture. They're not, they're not into crops, MFIs. Um, poor rural infrastructure, I hear this over and over from the farms. The quality of the farm to market roads, inadequate storage, one I never expected, 
too few partners with dirt under their fingernails. And we all know the problems with the ag extension services. We all know all these NGOs that are going out and trying to almost become parallel extension services. But there are few, few of them in these countries working with farmers. There are so many groups working on policy. There are so many groups going out there and saying, we will build the capacity of national partners. But very few national groups or international with the dirt under their fingernails that actually work with farms. Shocking. Uh, government interference in markets. Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya, Zambia. Um, in West Africa, the big problem has really been, is many, but subsidized imports under cutting local production, which is what Megan and Jerry and uh, Andy Hill and Ed worked on with us uh, with Howard's uh, support in South Sudan, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, uh, and with beans in Latin America. Although in Latin America we're very blessed because the government of Honduras runs a national school feeding program, and because of corruption, they want us to do the buying for them nationally. So the EU gave us a grant there to put in, and we used the money to put in regional cleaning and drying facilities. I mean commercial scale in every region of six of them, in every region of, uh, of Honduras, because the EU had the food facility after the 2008 price hike. The only condition was, here's $6 million. The only condition is you must spend it in 12 months. So that was where it was invested. So we, we are buying the food for the government's national school feeding program with the government's money. And the government said, our condition is you buy it locally. So therefore, the fact that it didn't meet import parity, which is a WP condition, we can't buy it more than we would buy from the trade, which could be a problem sometimes, because the farmers start to say, oh, but that's not as much as we had expected. We thought your WP, you could pay us a premium. And we can't pay a premium. We can pay the same we would pay the big trader, but we can't pay more than the IPP. But the government of Honduras says, yes, buy the beans here, even though it's above an IPP. We want to use our money to buy them in this country. Then um, I should mention a bit of post-conflict countries. This is the Condep Center. In DRC, we've been working in eastern and western DRC in one territory in each, so it's fairly small. But uh, there are no other development projects there. We had to bring in the technical partners to work with us. Uh, in the east, in Katanga province, it's, it's a territory uh, that was productive before the conflict. But it was mined during the conflict. Everybody left. Danish Relief, uh, Danish Refugee Council was given a demining contract. We hooked up with them to do the demining and then come in with the P4P, with FAO doing the um, agricultural training. And we started off with DRC, who then has left the country, unfortunately, and we moved to Oxfam. Uh, organizing local traders, 120 local traders, who were really largely women, uh, to buy from the farmers' organizations. And, you know, in these territories, you have like a, it's not a district, but it's sort of the, the equivalent, the, the capital town. I mean, most of them, they've got about six roads that go out, and the roads go out for 40 kilometers or so. So every village along every road was organized into a, a uh, Organisation Producer Aizan. So, a farmers organization. And uh, they are producing. They're producing, they're selling. I'm very interested to look at what's come out of that because I'm not clear on the quantities. I'm clear how happy the farmers are. I'm clear how happy the government is. I'm clear how happy the Belgians are but I'd like to look more under the surface. That's been replicated in Equator. In a, so we've got two very different ones in DRC. Um, in South Sudan, it was a hard struggle in the beginning. Uh, a lot of frustrations, but now we have hooked up with GIZ, which is a German government-funded uh, NGO entity, development entity. With them and with Howard again, we have installed 10 prefabricated warehouses 
in areas that are productive, where we've got farmers organizations that show promise. We have identified a management entity for each one of those warehouses who may be a small trader or maybe a farmers organization. We have got uh, in place GIZ or others linked to those farmers organizations to do the training. Uh, and we're linking this. The government is very keen to have a strategic grain reserve. Uh, we have a big program to develop the feeder roads. And they're supposed to be farm to market roads among them. So that is, we're linking the strategic grain reserve development process to the feeder road process, to the P4P process. Um, and now, of course, GIZ's international staff have been taken out of the country with the troubles. But I'm hoping they'll come back soon. They've just made a movie, which we've also posted on our website about it. Very optimistic, enthusiastic movie, but you know, they're very, very pleased also to get something going in agriculture in San Sudan. We're working there in the three equatorias, west, central, and eastern Ecuador. In uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, everything had fallen apart during the wars. So we've been working with very small groups. Some of them were groups that were in existence before the war and were resuscitated after the conflict stopped. Um, uh, they're small groups. We've had to reduce the amount, the quantities that we'll buy down to 10 tons of milk rice in Liberia to make it work. They split into two different types of, uh, of programming. One is for patty, and the other is for processing and milk. So they buy the patty, and then they contract to other groups to do the milling. Uh, Afghanistan is the, the fifth one. And in Afghanistan, because of security, we have set about with a very generous Canadian funding uh, for five years with no, thankfully, end date on it, which is always a WP problem. And they say, here's money, but you've got 12 months to spend. Uh, a national processing industry, because that didn't exist. And so we've been working on developing a fortified uh, wheat flour industry, working with private sector uh, millers. We're working with the government and with FAO on putting in place food quality standards, which don't exist in Afghanistan to date and certainly aren't enforced. We are working on a ready-to-use supplementary food, which uh, is something similar to a clumpy nut, but locally produced from broken almonds. Uh, some problem with the machinery, but we're plugging away. And we've started producing high energy biscuits, which should be able to go also on the market. And we're doing social marketing in that regard. And then we're linked to a very interesting South Korean group called Nutrition Education International, NEI, uh, which the South Korean government just gave us a substantial grant to continue to partner with NEI and fund them in Afghanistan to try and get uh, soybean production up and moving, and that we can use the soybeans in our ready supplementary food, which we also hope will become a marketable product. Mm -hmm. So again, a very interesting, very different model. We have managed to buy 10,000 tons of wheat locally. We never bought locally before in Afghanistan from farmers groups. But we can't get our international staff out to the farmers groups because of the security. <laughs> OK. So I'll close by just stressing that uh, this really, it's a learning program. You can call it operational research. Um, another aspect of the research is we linked to do the um, analysis of the quantitative data to a consortium of African universities that's called African Economic Research Consortium. 37 African universities that set up a hub, and uh, they are doing uh, all of the data cleaning, uh, analysis, and write-up of the quantitative work. Um, we, they brought in then researchers from 37 universities that are linked to the consortium. And we have agreed that all the data sets will be in the public sphere and that they can be used for further research by all these universities. They can use the P4P experience for for research and for teaching, which has begun to, to, in some of the countries. And we're going to put all the data sets, all the clean data sets, and all the analysis up on a public website that we're creating with the AERC by the end of 2020. 
So the next steps, my very last bit of my scribbled notes to myself this morning, are um, we have this evaluation ongoing. Uh, we will get a draft report in September, the final report in November. It will go to our executive board in February 2015, so 11 months from now. We're a little constrained be until the, exec the executive board says, oh, this is great. You should keep going. So we're doing guidance, but we have to call it lessons learned because we don't have the message from the executive board that we can really do this. Therefore, we've written it into the, exec the strategic plan for the next four years. Our strategic plan is 2014-2017. So what it's said in there is one aspect of WP's programming will be pro-smallholder programming, which can be done in non-pilot countries also under the strategic plan, through programs such as Purchase for Progress, because we have, don't have a green light yet from the executive board that Purchase for Progress is something we can take beyond the pilot. Mm -hmm. So now we're also very busy sending our people out to help design these programs in other countries like Burundi, uh, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, um, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Ecuador, so, I mean Bolivia, Peru, I'm not sure Bolivia, Peru, it's just mushrooming mm -hmm. this thing. Um, a number of the pilot countries have already received ongoing money to keep this going. They don't have to worry about the next five years. They already have funds in the bank. Canada loves this. They funded uh, Guatemala and Nicaragua to continue for another five years plus money to buy food. And they probably will fund Honduras as well. Um, I don't expect more money from Howard to be with me, which is fine. We got it started. We've kept it going in the other three post-conflict ones, where we'll talk this afternoon about more of my uh, South Sudan and Kenya have mainstreamed it into their country programs, and whatever money comes into the country, they can use across the program, so they're they're set to keep going. Um, and I'm glad to say. We are now working with FAO and Ethernet. We have a meeting later this week, this month, in fact, to develop a joint proposal how we can move forward and build on these lessons together as a joint RBA effort. Uh, and I will say I am hoping that when we talk this afternoon, we can find a way to work again with Condev uh, to help draw lessons from the experience of the post pilot. So I think I went on longer than I planned, but that is one of my weaknesses. This is great. Thank you. This is a fantastic presentation. Very, very rich. And thank you for all of the information you provided. I know there can be lots of questions. I'll ask one really quick. Uh, just you know, in some associations with FAO and other United Nations organizations in the past, there's been a little.